So if children are God's best gift, then why is parenting so hard? I mean, when I took this gift home from the hospital, I had no idea what I was doing. Diapers, sleepless nights, and it was just getting started. We need his help. The Fresh Church Podcast. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Fresh Church Podcast. Today, I want to discuss parenting. What does the Bible say about raising kids? Am I even doing a good job? What are some fresh ways that I can raise my kids? You know, I remember back when we had our first child, I was so excited when Nathan was born. He was perfect. Like seriously, he was seven pounds, seven ounces, 21 inches long. I mean, seven seven and then seven times a trinity like of course he's perfect right can you get any more perfect than that he had more hair on top of his head than i did score okay i just held him in my arms in that hospital i loved him so much i was one proud dad he had jaundice so his skin was a little yellow they told us when we took him home we had to put him in a blue box with special lights for a couple hours a day i joked it was an incubator Then they walked us to our car and they refused to discharge us until they had double checked that we'd put the car seat in correctly. Car seat, check. Blue box, check. Parenting manual, Uh, nothing. My wife had bought this book that was super popular at the time called What to Expect While You're Expecting. She read it like the Bible. But now that we had our baby, what were we supposed to do? We were young. I was working three jobs at the time. We had taken a year off of college or working our way to get back there. We lived in a little apartment attached to the end of a storage unit that we managed and we made it work. One of the things about parenting is is bringing out the best and worst in you. Um, you, You realize all the things that you would do for your child. You experience a new kind of love and responsibility. You also find out those sleepless nights, how easily irritated you can become. You work on character traits in your life as you start to see them come out in your child's life as they grow. We watch what we say because what we do, they reflect it accordingly. And you realize that this is one of the greatest gifts that you could have ever received, children. So we read a couple of parenting books. We went through a couple of parenting classes, but it wasn't until about 10 years into this whole thing that we ran across a passage of scripture in Psalms that forever changed our perspective on parenting. It's in that passage that I would like to share with you today. We're going to walk through Psalm 127, and then I want to help you see how the core values of fresh family, relationship, experience, safety, and hope come to light in this passage. Whether you're getting ready to have your first child, raising one or or 10 kids, or maybe you've grown already and you're hoping to speak into your adult children's lives or maybe your grandchildren. This passage is for you. Are you ready? Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. Children are a gift from the Lord. They're a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. That's it. Five verses. But five verses that will change your life. You know, I'm actually going to be sharing uh, some of these at a parenting conference next month. And and I would love the opportunity to speak in the lives of parents in your church as well. I mean, you can find out more about that on our website, uh, www.freshman.org. So the first two verses that you've heard of before, we like to use them in church during prayer times, building projects, and vision casting. Unless the Lord builds the house. But now we know the verses three through five deal with children. Because, well, we just read that. So perhaps Solomon, the writer of this psalm, is talking specifically about your home. I mean, listen to how the NIV puts this. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guard stands watch in vain. 
In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. So before we get to the whole children parenting part of this passage, I want to show you some incredible truths that you need to understand as a parent. The first one's this. He needs to be the center of your home. You can't do it on your own or else you're working in vain. It has to be God who watches over your house. Not, not to say we don't work hard or watch over our home, but we have to make sure God is first. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. The second thing is this, we have a responsibility to work, to provide for our families. Now, now you can work yourself to death, but remember, it is God who takes care of your needs. Psalm 128, 2, you will enjoy the fruit of your labor how joyful and prosperous you will be. Philippians 4.19 And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So number three, we see this. That God's desire is for there to be rest, peace, and sleep in your house. Can anyone agree with that? Hallelujah! Lord, give us sleep. Exodus 33, 14, the Lord replied, I will personally go with you and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. John 14, 27, Jesus says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Or how about this one in Proverbs 3, 24, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down in your sleep be sweet. We pray that over our kids that they'll have sweet sleep. You see, these are principles that, that we need to start with before we ever get into anything about kids. This is, this is good stuff. I mean, we could stop right here, but we're not gonna. Okay, let's keep reading. Psalm 127 verses 3 through 5. Children are a gift from the Lord. They're a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is a man whose quiver is full of them. Now, now, there are five things we realize about children and parenting from this passage. The first one is this, that children are a heritage, or another version calls them a gift. It's an inheritance. You see, all the things that you collect here on earth when you're done, you can't take it with you. Money, houses, prestige, social media status, it, it all stays here when you die. But the inheritance you get to take with you into eternity is your children. And you get to help with the direction of their eternal destination. So children are a heritage. They're family. And, and I don't know what your family heritage is. Maybe you have fantastic parents. Maybe you don't. Maybe the last thing you want is for your kids to turn out like your family. Well, good news. They don't have to. You see, at Fresh, we believe in the core value of family. That means your family is important. And we believe that it's important for your family to be connected to the church family. And that the church family, it's, it's not perfect, but we need each other to survive, to make it, to help ensure that your kids are headed in the right direction. Now that you have a family, you need to get your family connected into the family of God. Now we have some crazies in our family, okay? uh, but we want what's best for you and your family as well. And that's where we get connected with adopted, if you will, grandparents, uncles and aunts, cousins, family. We need to live in community. So, so two years ago, we moved to Finley, Ohio to be with my wife's parents. And they retired here and we wanted to be with them through this season. And, and as a pastor, I have spent most of our married life away from family. I mean, even when we were close, we were still at least an hour away. This is the first time that we've lived in the same town, in the same community. What does that mean? Well, that means we do lunch together after church on Sundays. It means that we do dinner on Wednesday nights together as a big family. We spend holidays together. When, when we can't get our daughter after school, the grandparents are there. Literally, as I'm filming this podcast, grandma's bringing an afternoon snack to Christina and taking her to a doctor appointment for me. Family is there for each other. But all those years, I wasn't near family. And I had to rely on on the church family. So when I needed after school help, I called church family, Aunt Debbie. When I needed a place to stay, it was mom and dad, Carolyn and Dell. When I was out of town and the breaker box was acting up and Heather needed help, I called 
Uncle Orlando. When my son just needed to talk to someone, it was Uncle Gary who took him to the gym that looked like American Ninja Warrior set. When I opened my door and there was a bucket of oranges from Uncle Rick, life was happier. When we needed family pictures, Cousin Naomi was there. She took him in front of Grandma Connie's car. The church was our family. I wasn't related to any of them, but they were family. Church needs to be your family. You see, this gift that you've been given is, is part of your heritage. So get connected with the family who can help you. Number two, as we continue in verse three, it says that their offspring, um, or the New American Standard Version, and also the New King James Version says, the fruit of the womb. And, and I love the symbolism of, of fruit. So, so I grew a garden last year. I mean, we had radishes and tomatoes and zucchini. I mean, huge zucchinis that we had to get creative with all kinds of recipes in order to make sure they didn't go to waste. But I didn't just drop a seed in the ground. The next day I had zucchini. I had to work the soil, plant the seed, water it, weed it, tie it to a stand to help it grow upright. I had to nurture it. You see, God has given you this, this wonderful seed that you get to nurture until it's producing fruit. I can't just drop a seed and forget about it. I mean, that's how some people parent, unfortunately. So how do we do it differently? You see, we believe in the power of relationships. You need a relationship with your child. Nurture that relationship. Grow it. Talk to them. Listen to them. Care for each other. And you're not going to be perfect. You're going to mess up along the way but you need to provide a safe place for them. You see, we always prayed with our kids every night. We would go in their rooms and talk about their day, pray for them, tuck them in and tell them that we love them. Years and years of this habit, night after night, all three of them in their teen years, we saw a shift. They started coming into our rooms at night and talking to us. It was during that time of their crazy day that they felt safe to talk. Not after school, not at dinner, just before bed. They'd share what's going on. We'd pray together. In fact, I, I remember one night when my middle child was a junior and she came in and she tucked us into bed and prayed for us. It's about relationship. Not only do you need to grow and nurture a relationship with your child, but you need to help them build relationships with, with people around them. Uh, are, are you connecting with people in your church? They, they might not want to go to church in middle school but they need the relationship. They need the connections. Grow relational fruit in their lives. So verse three tells us that this heritage, this fruit is a reward from who? God. And so when I think of reward, it's, it's, it's like a trophy, a feeling of excitement, a, a symbolic treasure that helps me to remember. That's the experience part of parenting. Make sure you're creating memories with your kids. Do things together. Have game nights, movie nights. Make your own meal nights. Do things together. Get out of the house. Go on vacation. Visit a park, a national park. Go to the lake, the ocean. Go to museums, amusement parks, mini golf courses, escape rooms. Go on a scavenger hunt in Costco. Do something. Have an experience. At the end of every one of our experiences, we ask the question, what was your favorite part? Why? Well, we want to remember the awesome, not the awfuls. You see, there will always be bad things that happen. Bad attitudes, fights, issues with the meal. But there was an awesome memory in there that we want to remember. The reward that we take home and put on the shelf. And I look back at raising three kids and I can tell you all kinds of awesome experiences that we had. That we had together. But beyond that, I want my kids to experience God and the rewards of being in his presence. So we made camps a priority, going to church, special events. I was on staff at a big church, and every time we had a big speaker come in, I made sure I introduced my kids to them and the possibility that maybe they would pray over them, get to know them. I wanted my kids to experience God as well. My reward is seeing them have those God moments and know that they're on the right track. Those experience, those wow moments, it's part of the reward. Now, verse four tells us that they're like arrows. 
And, and, and what do you know about an arrow? I'm not, I'm not an archer, but I do know the basics of what an arrow is. I mean, there's a straight wooden shaft or a, a metal shaft on this arrow, and it, and it can't be crooked or nicked up or else the arrow goes in all kinds of crazy directions. And there's feathers on the back, and they've got to be just right or else it messes up the direction of it. And then there's a tip. There's a point on this arrow that causes it to stick into the target at whatever you're shooting at. Well, your child is an arrow. And there's two things that we see here. One, it's your responsibility to help make a good arrow. And two, they're in your hands. What it says in verse in verse four there, like arrows in the hands of a warrior. That's you, mom and dad. You are responsible for these arrows, your children. And this is where the value of safety comes in. I need to protect this arrow to ensure where they go, that they go in the direction that they need to go. Remember, they've been entrusted into my hands. So more than I need to trust my kids, my kids need to know that they can trust me to take care of them. More than I need to trust this arrow is going where it needs to go, the arrow needs to trust that it's safe in the hands of the warrior. So I create safe environments for my kids, even when they don't like it. We have rules. We have standards. And there are consequences if they choose to make bad choices because I need to keep my arrows sharp, straight, and undamaged as much as possible. I speak into their choice of friends, their media engagements, what they do and who they do it with. And, and I'm, I'm responsible for the year's arrows and I don't take it lightly. Now I'm thankful for God's grace and his mercy. And even when I mess up or they mess up, God comes back and he straightens it and he forgives it all. He puts them back on track. But I still have a responsibility. You see, for the most part, the, the church is a safe place for my kids. They can make friends and get involved with activities that are safe. When I passed through a church with four services, there were two different families that would stay my kids during the last service and take them to lunch. There were people looking out for my kids and helping them along the way, helping them pay for missions trips or find someone to teach music lessons. But I also needed to protect my kids from some of the people in church, especially if you're on staff pastors. Each of my kids had a rough experience due to some of the people, some of the staff at the churches we were at. Although church is a great place for my kids, it's still full of broken people. My kids need to trust that I'm going to do what is best for them. And finally, number five, we see in verse five, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Now, when we see blessed, we can also say happy, fortunate, joyful. I'm filled with joy because of my children. Even when I'm having a bad day, why? Hope. Right? Hope is the confidence that what God said he was going to do will actually happen. And so whether we're having a good week or a bad week, we have hope. We have the promises of God that we hang on to. So when the doctor gives us a diagnosis and scares us, or when the doctor tells us they don't understand how suddenly that's been reversed, that's part of the hope. When the finances are scary or when there's abundance, when the friends leave us in tears and, and when they make our day, when you don't get the part we wanted and we become the star of the show. When everything is coming together or it's all falling apart, we have hope. God is able. And, and as a parent, I want to remind my kids that no matter what, God is going to keep his promises. We'll walk in love, filled with joy, always full of hope. So as you raise your kids, connect your family with a church family. Nurture relationships. Reward yourself with awesome experiences. Provide safe environments for your kids. And never forget that our hope is in Jesus. So as we close our time, I want to read this passage again from the Message Paraphrase Translation of the Bible from Psalm 127. Don't you see that children are God's best gift, the fruit of the womb, his generous legacy. Like a warrior's fistful of arrows are the children of a vigorous youth. Oh, how blessed are the parents when their quivers full of children. Your enemies don't stand a chance against you. You'll sweep them right off your doorstep. I thank God for my kids. Have you told your kids recently how much you love them? I think right now would be a perfect time to do so. And I'll see you next time on the Fresh Church Podcast.